Welcome to Resolution, an initiative of Josh McDowell Ministry. Here we equip you to help youth overcome hurts and struggles and start thriving in life with Christ and others. I'm your host, Ben Bennett. Welcome to Season 1. Hey everyone, welcome back again to the Resolution Podcast. Ben Bennett here, and I'm so stoked for today's episode. We're going to be talking about thriving in life and something I call the seven longings. Can't wait to get into it. And this topic means a lot to me because for years of my life, I wasn't thriving. I was stuck in struggles, hurts, uh, anxiety, depression, shame, going back again and again to pornography, wondering about my value and my identity. And I was experiencing such hardship in in life. Uh, I felt burdened. I felt like I was barely surviving, yet alone thriving. I longed for more and I longed to thrive. What I love about this word thrive is it captures so much of life. It means to flourish, to advance, to succeed, to do well, to experience satisfaction in all life has to offer. And I think all of us, deep down, we desire to thrive. Uh, We desire to experience satisfaction, to enjoy our relationships, to get the most out of life, to make an impact, to fulfill our purpose and our potential. If you think about it, most hours every day we spend attempting to thrive. Many of us go to school for years in order to graduate, to go on to college, to get degrees so that we can get a good job and make an impact in the world in a specific field of study. We spend time investing in important relationships our friends, our family, our spiritual relationship with God. We go to the gym, we play sports, we invest in hobbies, and we do all these things not to make life worse, but to experience all that life has to offer, to experience a better life, a thriving life. And products are sold by the millions every single day in an attempt to make life better. Uh, Even crazy ones like infomercials. I don't know about you, but if you've uh, ever seen an infomercial, sometimes I'll I'll just get on YouTube and watch a ton of them because some of them are pretty hilarious. And uh, some of them go out of business because they actually don't help people thrive all that that much. But um, they can be so convincing. Why? Because we want... To thrive. We want something to help life be better. We want to experience all life has to offer. But no matter what we try, when it comes to thriving, there's something that has to be at the foundation, something within our design that must be in place. And that something is healthy relationships. That is what allows us to truly thrive. Harvard recently released findings from a study that has gone on for decades. It's one of the longest studies ever concluded or ever conducted in history. The current head of the study says this, the clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is this good relationships, keep us happier and healthier period. See at the core of thriving and satisfaction in life is healthy relationships. And this isn't just some societal phenomenon. No, this is deeply rooted in Christianity. It's historically a Christian idea. We see this as early as the first book of the Bible. In Genesis 1 and 2, God had created a paradise for Adam and Eve in Eden. It was a, a garden that was designed to meet their needs. All their physical needs were met with food, water, shelter, air, but they also had relational and spiritual needs. They were designed for good relationships, not just with one another, but also with God and themselves. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but we all have a relationship with ourselves. I mean, have you ever had a thought like, 
oh, I can't believe I did that. Or, oh man, I'm such an idiot. I messed up again. That's an example of your relationship with yourself. And we can be so critical of ourselves. And all day long, we have thoughts, beliefs, uh, feelings, things that are going on in our head. And that's an, an example of our relationship with ourself. Uh, but the point is we're created for healthy relationships with God, with ourselves, and with one another. And Adam and Eve were in perfect relationships in these three categories in Eden. There was mutual trust. They lived in harmony. They were known and loved. There was no hurt or pain or suffering. They had an abundance of everything they needed relationally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. I love Genesis 2.9. It says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. I love that because it's such a beautiful picture of this environment that Adam and Eve experienced, an environment that was awesome, trees everywhere, growing things like, uh, I just imagine endless supplies of Krispy Kreme donuts and Reese's peanut butter cups, Chick-fil-A chickens running around the Garden of Eden, Christian chickens, But, but God had set up an amazing place for them to thrive. And that was the original intent for us, to experience the full satisfaction of our desires there. And God put within the first people and us desires, heart longings that drive everything we do. And these longings can only be satisfied in these relational contexts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do in life flows from it. See, everything we do, the good things, the bad things, our thoughts, our beliefs, our behaviors, everything is being driven by our heart longings and the long and the desire for those longings to be satisfied. The good choices, the bad, everything is driven by these. And throughout the Bible, there are seven longings we see that drive everything we do. They're they're wired within us. We can't help but seek these out. We're designed to have these longings fulfilled by God and others in the present, but especially as kids growing up, especially in childhood with both a father and a mother who come alongside us, who help us figure out who we are, who meet us there. And it's it's so interesting. I can't get into it today, but even how the scaffolding of our, our brains, the wiring of our brains is developed in a healthy way if these longings are satisfied, but also goes um, unfulfilled uh, or not fully developed if these aren't satisfied. And that's a whole other subject can't get into today, but Even these longings have a biological effect on us, whether or not they're fulfilled. The fulfillment of these seven longings leads to a foundation of true wholeness. And I define wholeness as the completeness that comes from God's design for human flourishing. The completeness that comes from God's design for human flourishing. This idea of true wholeness sets the stage for part one of what we'll be talking about in these podcasts called The Wholeness Apologetic. And we'll be talking about today what it looks like to experience this wholeness, this true wholeness, the life of thriving that we were designed to experience. Part two of The Wholeness Apologetic is about why we get stuck in struggles, why we get stuck in unwanted behaviors, um, issues in our life, things we continue to go back to that we don't want to keep going back to. And then part three of the wholeness apologetic is how we heal. And we'll be getting into and how we heal and how we return to this life we were created to experience. We'll be getting deeper into those uh, topics in future episodes. When this episode and the next one, we'll touch on all of these seven longings. If we help teens 
seek the fulfillment of these longings in healthy relationships with God and others. They will thrive. They will be known. They will have the support, the help, and the guidance that they need. Most of the time, they won't turn to unhealthy things as they experience the satisfaction of living into the flourishing design that God has for them. They'll be less prone to be overwhelmed, anxious, or depressed because they'll have a foundation of knowing who they truly are, their value, and they'll be connecting with others about their needs. This is especially true when it comes to the role of parents. I mean, youth pastors, youth leaders, spiritual mentors, pastors, spiritual fathers and mothers are all so important, but the role of a parent is crucial and so unique, especially when it comes to helping fulfill these seven longings in the life of young people. And this shows up in study after study all throughout the decades, just how important this is. For example, I recently came across a study from Ad Health, and they found that when it comes to kids having an average or especially high-quality relationship with their fathers in an intact family, boys are less likely to engage in delinquent behavior. Girls are less likely to become pregnant as teens, and both boys and girls are less likely to become depressed everything starts to change. Another study from 2015 in the Journal of Marriage and Family found that the more time U.S. adolescents spent engaged in activities with both parents, the less likely they were to have behavioral problems. See, if if teens experience these seven longings and seek them out, their life would change drastically. How do I know? I've experienced my life changed drastically through the fulfillment of these seven longings. And with the hundreds of young people that I've worked with, I've seen their lives change drastically too. They've began to experience healing and freedom, this new sense of purpose and identity. Uh, It's changed the way they view themselves and the world around them and why they're here. Now, all of these seven longings begin with a, and Josh McDowell and I have spent years working uh, on these, researching, meeting with therapists and pastors and, and um, looking at the scriptures and uh, identifying these seven longings. So we'll just go ahead and get into the seven longings. First, I want to talk about the longing of acceptance. The first longing, acceptance. This is to be included, loved, and approved of as you are, no matter what. To be included, loved, and approved of as you are, no matter what. This communicates, I'm capable. I'm capable. Romans 15, 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. See, this is how Jesus treats us. He accepts us as we are, flaws and all. He doesn't ask us to fix ourselves up before coming to him or or to get it all together first. No, he invites us to come as we are, and he freely offers us forgiveness for our wrongs, for the ways we've turned away from him, for the things we've done to other people. And he offers us a relationship with him solely through what he did on the cross, his life, his death, his resurrection, him taking our wrongdoings upon himself, uh, defeating them, um, fulfilling God's perfect standard. And now he freely offers us to that and he accepts us as we are. He accepts us. He approves us. He includes us. He delights in us. And this is what he tells us to do to one another, to accept one another as he accepts us. This longing probably carries the most weight. I mean, all of the seven longings are important, but this one is unique. It carries the most weight in the life of a person 
It's kind of like a foundational longing. It carries the most weight and has the greatest effect if it's met or not in someone's life. I know how powerful this longing is in my own life. If you caught the episode before this one, you'll have heard of a lot of the, the hurt and the pain I experienced in life and, and feelings of not belonging, feelings of, of loneliness, uh, like I couldn't measure up to the expectations of other people. And I experienced that for years of my life. And when I went away to college at George Mason University, um, I experienced the love and acceptance, the inclusion of, un, of other people in a way that I had seldom experienced in life. And it changed me radically. People loved me. They accepted me. The, these people were serious about Jesus, and they cared for me, and they wanted to hang out with me. They asked me questions about my life. Uh, they, they, they came over. We talked. We did things t- together. We went and got food uh, together. They wanted to be around me. And God eventually used this to draw me back to himself. And I started uh, taking my faith seriously and running after God and growing in my relationship with him uh, months later as I encountered this radical acceptance and love of God through people again and again and again. And acceptance helps us experience the value that God has given us. On our good days, on our bad days, our va- we, we, we are valued, we are loved, we are of infinite worth. At a foundational level, this is the key, to, to treat others as wanted, as valuable individuals. With teens, it builds within them the sense of purpose, of value, of confidence, of knowing who they are, how much they're loved, and when they're steadfast and solid in that, then they can begin to make an impact in this world and freely give love and and serve and care for other people. But it starts with them experiencing the radical acceptance of God, and oftentimes it comes through other people. The second longing is appreciation. This is to be thanked or encouraged for what you've done, to be thanked or encouraged for what you've done. This communicates, I'm capable. I'm capable. So while acceptance is about knowing our being matters, appreciation is about knowing our doing matters. Knowing our doing matters. It's about being thanked or encouraged for what you've done, regardless of the quality of it, regardless of the performance ability. Think about the last time you worked hard at something and and someone encouraged you or thanked you or showed um, that they appreciated what you had done. How validating, how capable that might have made you feel. Or maybe it's easier to think about all of the recent times you didn't experience that. Maybe um, you, you cooked a meal for someone, maybe you worked really hard on, on a project and um, gave your best effort. Maybe you uh, did something kind for the youth uh, in your life or, or maybe one of your own teens. And maybe you felt missed. Maybe it went unacknowledged and in the loss you might have experienced, how invalidated or unappreciated you might have felt in that moment. Think about that in your life because that gives an understanding as to how powerful appreciation is when we experience it or when we don't experience it and how important it is. As a teen, I played the drums. I was really big into music. I was big into punk music. One of my friends played the guitar. Another friend played the bass guitar. And we'd get together and just jam out in the garage. And we eventually started writing some songs and would play them. And I still remember to this day uh, when my youth leader dropped by. It was a Saturday morning or, or something. And we were playing music and he dropped in. 
unexpectedly. And it was a little awkward or a little um, uh, embarrassing at first. I just felt exposed to be uh, playing, you know, drums and and whatnot in, in front of my youth leader because I hadn't performed in front of anyone before besides my friends. And my youth leader was just so encouraging. And he asked us to play one of our songs. And I remember finishing the song and how encouraging he was. He said, good job. That was awesome. And it made me feel so confident, so capable. It made me desire to take more and more risks, to continue writing music, to continue trying to grow. And that's the power of appreciation in the lives of young people. It helps them feel capable, helps them take more and more risks. I think it's easier to think that uh, people in life um, who, who don't want to take risks or don't want to work out, work hard at something are just lazy. That can become our default tendency to think that. But in reality, this is an issue of appreciation, of learning that they are capable, of growing in competency. So the fastest way um, to help somebody or or the quickest and most beneficial way to help someone get out of of laziness and grow and develop is to show appreciation for, for the smallest things, for the biggest things in their lives. This helps them continue to take risks, feel empowered, and realize that they are capable. And the third longing is affection. This is to be cared for with gentle touch or emotional engagement. To be cared for with gentle touch or emotional engagement. This communicates, I'm lovable. I'm lovable. Decades ago, a study was done in the U.S. involving 40 newborns. And they did the study to see if infants could thrive if their basic physical needs were provided. Or to see and find out if affection was also necessary. So the infants were separated into two groups. In group one, the caregivers were instructed to feed, bathe, and change the diapers of the infants, but to do nothing else, not to communicate with them at all, not to uh, smile at them or pick them up more than was necessary. But the experiment was halted after just four months, after half of the infants tragically died. This was a horrific tragedy. There was no physiological cause for the baby's death. At the same time, in a separate facility, the second group of 20 newborns were provided with basic physical needs and with caring words, hugs, and kisses from their caregivers. And group two recorded not a single death. Astonishing. The results of this study obviously were heartbreaking. They were tragic. They were horrific. It was so sad that this happened. But the conclusion was that nurture and affection is actually a very vital human need. Nurture and affection is actually a very vital human need. See, children can't get too much affection. Likewise, we as uh, adults, we need daily affection and emotional engagement. We, we have this longing to be shown such care, and it never goes away. We see this in the biblical accounts of Jesus and the little children. Matthew 19, 13 says that people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. A gentle touch, words of blessing, things like that communicate the sense of value and it provides emotional reinforcement. It helps a person believe that he or she is lovable. Few things influence our well-being and our development as kids and teens, like the emotional engagement and affection of parents. And if teens or kids have a a close relationship with their parents, where they don't fear judgment, but can share anything and be met with acceptance and a calm tone, although 
it's so hard to do at times, the teens are, are much more likely to ask for help when they're hurting, when, when they're struggling, when they're in their time of need. Why? Because they've had these experiences of knowing that, that my mom, that my dad, that my youth leader are safe people, that they actually want to help me, that they're not going to judge me, they're not going to condemn me, but they have my best interest in mind and they want to come alongside me and help me. I've talked to so many teens who haven't wanted to share things with their parents or with authority figures in their life because they're terrified of how they'll respond. Uh, Because in the past, parents or the authority figures have blown up at them and gotten angry. And those experiences have left this um, reminder in their life um, to not go to their parents or to their youth leader or authority figure in their time of need uh, because they fear that they won't be helped. They fear that they're going to be rejected. So how powerful it is, as hard as it is, if we can engage young people and, and listen to them and, and be calm and hear them out and offer help if they're willing to receive it and, and come alongside them and remind them that we have their best interest in mind, that we want to support them, that we're for them, that we want the best for them. So think about the longings we talked about today, acceptance, appreciation, and affection. And think about those in your life. How can you move towards them? How, how can you engage their longings? How can you come alongside them? And when it seems like they're struggling or hurting or um, something is going on, move towards acceptance, appreciation, and affection and see what God does. See the power of those things and how it helps fulfill their longings and bring satisfaction and thriving in their lives. And think about your own life. How have those things gone unmet in the past, in the present? Where are you craving those things to be satisfied now? Is it in your marriage? Is it in your relationship with your significant other? Is it in your relationship with your friends or or your parents? We all have these desires to have these longings fulfilled. We're wired to have them fulfilled. And when they are fulfilled, we start to thrive. We experience the life that God created us to live, one of satisfaction, of wholeness, of freedom, of health. Next week, we'll continue with the remainder of the seven longings, but continue to think about how have these longings gone unmet or met in your life as we find the fulfillment of these longings in the ways that God has designed us to experience them. We start to thrive. We experience contentment. We experience true satisfaction in life. Thanks for listening to the Resolution Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean so much to us if you rate it, share it, and subscribe. To be part of the Global Resolution Movement, connect with us on social media and YouTube, at Resolution Movement. That's at Resolution Movement. And check out resolutionmovement.org for more information and resources. See you soon.